participants, attendees. All right, I see our attendees are coming in. Uh, welcome. My name is John Olagi. I'm a lieutenant with the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm in charge of the Advanced Hunter Ed program. And if you've joined us before, uh, you know that our webinars here are uh, to help um, entering hunters uh, get into the field without breaking down barriers and give you a little bit of confidence to make sure you're doing the right thing. So you do go out there and enjoy uh, our hunting tradition. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we're gonna be talking about chronic wasting disease. Uh, CWD is most commonly known as. Um, it is a big topic, especially in the West, Western states and with a lot of our uh, wildlife animals out there. I'm not gonna tell you what specific ones because it's a quiz question we're gonna have here in a second. But uh, really quick, I wanna go ahead and open it up. Um, we've got 24 attendees, 30 attendees. I'm gonna go ahead and start the polls and uh, give you a couple of backgrounds actually. Well, actually, let me, let me give you the ground rules. Um, if you've been here before, you know you can use the question answer function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can ask questions live to our, um, our panelists and they'll be able to either answer them live or we'll answer them with a written response. Uh, you can use the chat just to, for a comment, but please don't ask any questions there because they will get lost. Um, just so you know, a lot of the topics that we're covering tonight, the links for them will be sent out after the webinar. So don't be uh, worried about copy them, copying them down and uh, you know getting them. So this will be recorded, which I am recording. Okay, I want to make sure that was happening. And they will be available for viewing later on <clears throat> on our department YouTube channel. So really quick before we get started and I, before I introduce my, my panelists to you, my presenters, I'm gonna start with a poll and uh, here it is. And it will have a joke as it, I've been doing too. So I've launched it and the question is, which of these species does CWD affect? Check all that apply. <clears throat> we have deer, antelope, elk, bears and sheep. Uh, choose all the ones that you have um, that they, that they uh, affect. And the joke is, what do you call a bacterial disease caused by two grizzlies? Tuberculosis. <laughs> as long as I get a smile out of somebody, maybe a chuckle, it was worth putting up. Some of them aren't funny, but everybody's liking it so far. All right. So we're getting some answers. I'm gonna give it uh, Another five seconds and we'll shut it down and I'll share the results with you. And here we go, one, two, all right. And share results. So this is what you wrote down. Uh, people wrote down deer, antelope, elk, bears, and sheep. Okay, so we have all answers and categories um, there. Um, Dr. Brennan Monk, who's our presenter, Presenter tonight, can you tell me uh, which ones of those are correct? That would just be the deer and the elk. All and right. It's just the cervids. Deer and, and the elk. elk are not cervids. Yeah. All right. And then everybody, 95% uh, of you liked my joke. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. All right. So let's go to the next one. Next one is the states. And I'm going to launch. Here it goes. Which of these Western states have CWD? Choose all that apply. We have California, Nevada, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Arizona, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and Montana. So if it's one that you think has CWD presently, please mark it. All right, and the joke is, have you heard the joke about the non-infectious disease? I didn't get it. <laughs> All right, I get a kick out of them anyways. There's a lot of them I see on the internet that I can't get up here because they're not really appropriate, but some of them are pretty funny. So the internet has many amazing things. <clears throat> some of you aren't liking that joke. Oh man. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close it out. And uh, five, four, three, two, one. All right, so we had answers in every state. Somebody put an answer for every one. So uh, let's go through this, uh, Dr. Monk, and, and ask what, well, actually just note which ones are not 
uh, CWE uh, D states. Yeah, that's probably the easiest. So we don't have it in California. Yay. We don't have it in any of the adjacent states. So it's not in Arizona, it's not in Nevada, it's not in Oregon, and it hasn't been detected in Washington or Idaho yet. Oh, really? I thought Washington was a state. All right. Well, that's good. So we're going to learn more about this a little bit later. I'm going to go ahead and oops, share my results. I should have been sharing that with you. Uh, what, one thing to note, Colorado and Wyoming are the, are the two hotbeds. So okay. that, that plays out in the poll. All right. So Colorado and Wyoming are the, the hottest, have the highest incidences and that is reflected in your guys' answers, so that's good to see. And everybody guessed Montana, which it's you know, got spots in there too. All right, so there's the results, and you can see that. And so um, tonight we're going to be uh, joined by uh, Dr. Brandon Monk, who's a veterinarian, uh, veterinary, I guess, doctor of, uh, with our department, and Captain John Lawson. And um, they're going to be helping us with chronic wasting disease, what we need to know as hunters, either in our, within our own state or visiting others. What we, when we come back, if we're successful, what our actions should be uh, prior to coming back, uh, because there's rules and regulations in each state that uh, deal with not you know, transferring uh, and transporting these type of animals uh, that may be infected uh, around. So um, we're gonna go ahead and Let's go ahead and give this over to Brandon. Uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, Brandon. And, um, and uh, well, actually, I'll ask John first because he's uh, going to present a little bit later, but then we'll give it to you, Brandon. So, Captain Lawson, would you uh, go ahead and tell people about you? Yeah, uh, my name is John Lawson, obviously. Uh, I'm a captain with the department. Uh, my area of responsibility is basically the Sacramento area and those counties up in the Sierras, including... Placer and El Dorado, which is where Lake Tahoe is. Uh, I'm an avid hunter. I've uh, I put in for nine states and hoping to draw tags in all nine states, but that doesn't always happen. Uh, I've had a passion for wildlife since I was a kid. In fact, I went to Humboldt State University, received a degree in wildlife management with a minor in criminal justice. So you can kind of see where I wanted to go with my life. I've been at the department for 25 years. Uh, Completely love my job and what I do. So I appreciate being a part of this, this panel today. Thanks, appreciate having you here. Uh, Brandon, go ahead and introduce yourself to our, uh, our audience and take over the presentation. Yeah, hi, um, <clears throat> I've been at the department for just about five and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I bounced around between Colorado and Georgia doing some my veterinary work and my uh, wildlife disease training. I am the uh, senior big game veterinarian for the state of California. And I like John, I, I love my work. And this is this is the part of my work that I really like. I like talking about diseases of wildlife and I like talking about diseases of wildlife to our stakeholders. And that's um, a lot of what I enjoy. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to, to talk about something that I've worked on for, you know, off and on for 10 or 12 years now. And, and uh, something that I think is extremely important. And I'm going to see if I got this right. Am I sharing? Yeah, but it's on the notes page. So we need to okay. switch to the other one. And how do I do that? Let's see here. Stop sharing. Try this again. Worked good yesterday. There you go. You're good. There we go. All right. Pick the wrong choice. Okay. So let's get started. Um, part of this is uh, part of the reason I'm here is is we've we've really tried to hit the uh, the communication and outreach hard this year um, with with chronic wasting disease. It is not in California, and so some folks might be like, "Well, why do we care?" We care because so far nobody's been able to do anything to stop its spread. So it's not here. And hopefully it won't be here until after I retire, hopefully long after I retire, but um, I'm hedging my bets. Um, it's had an inexorable spread and odds are it's going to be here at some point. And I can't predict when that would be. 
So what are we going to talk about? A little bit about the disease, um, a little bit about the significance of the disease from a management concern, particularly for deer and elk. Uh, prevention through regulations in, in California. Very little bit about other states, but other states have also have their regulations. But also education and outreach. More and more, um, we are focusing more and more on education and outreach because the fact of the matter is, um, it, it's going to come down to our stakeholders and and, and hunters uh, to help protect us from this from this disease and and to help surveil for it. Early detection through active surveillance, and that's been a big focus of my job for the last few years, is trying to stand that program up. Rapid, robust response and long-term management, and that falls follows directly from a robust active surveillance program. So, what is it? And we are talking about a prion disease, and and. 40, 50 years ago, nobody ever talked about a prion disease because nobody knew what it was. And a prion disease is literally an infectious protein. But we've known about these diseases, didn't know what caused them, but we've known about the diseases themselves for over 200 years in veterinary medicine. So um, veterinarians have been dealing with scraping sheep for 200 plus years. Uh, recently, bovine spongiform encephalopathy in uh, cattle uh, became a big issue in the 90s uh, when there was an outbreak of mad cow disease, which um, uh, uh, tripped an outbreak of, of variant crutchfield Jacobs disease, this VCJD associated with people consuming tainted mad cow meat. And then in the 90s, or um, actually in the uh, early 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, CWD was first detected, chronic wasting disease. And then since then, uh, multiple other animal disease, animal prion diseases like camel prion diseases and, and a couple other critters. And then in humans, you've got Kuru, crutchfield Jacobs disease, fatal familial insomnia, and more and more work being done on other neurodegenerative diseases of people like uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and finding that, that these long-term neurodegenerative diseases in people might have prion-like activity and so um, that's kind of branching into a new field. And that's, that's kind of why we're talking about them as prion diseases now versus what we used to call them, which are spongiforms, uh, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. And prion literally refers to protein and infection. And this was a novel concept posed in like the 80s. And to this day, there are people that still don't really believe that our protein can be infectious, but all the work to date really points at, at this being the in, infectious agent for this disease. And it's a normal cellular protein. So it's a normal protein that is normally found in the cell wall of, of normal mammalian cells. That something, and we don't know what that something is, causes it to misform into this disease-causing morphology, this disease-causing structure. And if you look at the, at the red and the green, you've got these red and green swirls that then turn into these red and green flat bits, which are called beta pleated sheets. And when you flatten those bits out on a, pro on a protein, if you think about it in 3D, it allows these proteins to stack up. You start stacking proteins up and you get amyloid. And amyloid is literally just a bunch of proteins gathering in one area that they shouldn't be because these proteins are able to stack. You put more and more of those stacked proteins into a tissue and you start going from what we see as more normal brain tissue. And this is, this is a, it's called a photomicrograph. This is a, a microscopic section of a brain. And you can see little bits of, um, you can see the neurons here and then surrounded by a normal neuropil. And then you move over here to the middle and you've got moderate spongiform change. And it's literally referring to these holes, these holes in the brain. And you go over to severe and you get these holes in the brain. And the, the prevailing theory is that this amyloid builds up and it basically obliterates space in brain. And you know, you basically have Swiss cheese brain. It's hard to function with Swiss cheese brain. And, and it ends up being a 100% fatal disease in deer and elk and other servants. So from a management perspective, there's a, a number of challenges and I throw this picture of, of a prime age mule deer buck because in the places that have CWD, this is the poster child for CWD. 
the vast majority of animals that are coming back CWD positive in Colorado, Wyoming, et cetera, are these prime age bucks. They look 100% healthy, they look 100% normal, and these are, are, are often trophy animals that hunters are going for. So extended incubation period, meaning 15 plus months from the time that the animal is exposed to the infectious protein to the time that we start seeing clinical disease. And clinical disease is really just that wasting. So the, um, that, the, the neurologic changes that we see and then that general condition, that body condition just wastes away. So 15 plus months. And in that whole time, that animal is still running around, still looks 100% normal. There's no vaccine and there's been multiple attempts to develop one, but to date there's no vaccine. There's multiple strains and we're just kind of scratching the surface as, as to what that even means, what that might affect, how that might affect the management or the ecology of this disease. And we really kind of have an un, quote unquote unknown host range. And, and the reason for that is because we haven't done tests to figure out what all species are susceptible. Um, in the cervids that we have looked at for the most, for the majority of those, they are susceptible. So most of us in the wildlife health profession assume that if it's a cervid being the family cervidae, being the deer and the elk, about 50 plus ish species in that, in that family, if it's in that family, then we should consider it susceptible. Um, but 80%, 85% of those animals, there's been no infection trials done, so we don't really know for sure. And history told, tells us that we used to think that reindeer weren't susceptible, and then lo and behold, free-ranging reindeer come down with CWD in Norway. So a lot we don't know about the, the susceptibility of, of hosts and the different strain types and what that might mean. Other management challenges, that extended incubation period coupled with preclinical shedding. So an animal can be normal, look normal, no clinical disease, no clinical symptoms, no signs, running around doing its normal deer or elk thing, and it's peeing and pooping and drooling out infectious protein. This infectious prion is being shed into the environment by these animals that are otherwise normal. It's shed in all excreta, so pee, poop, saliva, eye boogers, um, it's a very robust pathogen. So that means we really have no effective measure to decontaminate an environment, a structure, anything. So we can't break down the infectious protein. And part of that goes back to that, that confirmation. The way that misfolding occurs, it blocks the site that we would normally use to break down a protein. So it effectively makes it um, uh, uh, very, very indestructible. And Brad, then it's, it was a good question really quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, how did we get that 15 month incubation period without seeing the results? How, how did they come up with that timeline? Infection trials. Um, there's been a lot of infection trials, particularly in white-tailed deer, mule deer, and elk. And in elk, um, that incubation period seems to be extended. And there's different... Uh, genetic makeups. Um, so in sheep, I mentioned uh, uh, scrapie in sheep, there's, there's genotypes. So there's, there's sheep that has a, a certain genotype that is actually not susceptible to scrapie. So that was, that was one line of study along uh, uh, for a while was, are there similar genotypes in deer? And what they found is there's similar genotypes in deer that make them uh, less susceptible, but they're still susceptible. And in elk, um, a study in elk in, in, in Wyoming showed that with that resistant genotype, it might be 15 years before the elk succumbs to CWD, but they uh -huh. still end up succumbing to CWD. Okay, thank you. Good, Absolutely. good answer. That was, that was a good, good question, good question. Um, and then environmental seeding. All of that stuff I just talked about, robust pathogen, preclinical shedding, shed and all excreta, it really sets it up for the environment to get contaminated and sometimes heavily contaminated with infectious protein, this prion. And a study showed that some plants might actually be able to take that infectious prion from the soil through their roots and transport it up through their stem up to their leaves. And so that could be a, a way of, of of getting it into susceptible animals, but it's also just 
on surfaces that deer are browsing on um, or, or otherwise coming across. So it's, the environmental factor is thought to be very, very important in the, in the ecology, epidemiology, and transmission of this disease. This is not a mule deer, apologies, um, but this and the next picture, uh, I think are just great examples of kind of what we're coming up against and what managers face. Uh, this is a white-tailed deer. This was a picture sent to me by Jason Sumners um, and I was working in Georgia doing a CWD surveillance uh, for 11 states, one of which was Missouri. And um, I was there when they, when they detected their first positive and free ranging deer. And after that, they, they, they went heavily towards um, uh, increasing their surveillance and they put up a bunch of game cameras. And this is one of those game cameras where they caught this doe and they were able to take this doe afterwards. And I'll get to that. So, you know, it's head down, ears are a little droopy, just looking at the eyes and the, the face of this animal it just looks quote unquote dull. Um, you can kind of see the points of the hip in the background. It's hard to tell depending on how bright your screen is, but I can see some drool coming out of its mouth. Um, wide, wide base stance and his legs in the front and the back. And you can see, see her walking away, heads down a little bit, ears are still down. Um, points of the, of the hip are a little bit more prominent. You can see the ribs a little bit. Um, and, and she just looks, looks not quite right on this picture. And this animal was CWD positive. They took this animal, they confirmed that this animal was CWD positive. And then if you look in the background, I count one, two, three, four, five. I count at least five eye shines. And they're all coming to this water source. They're all deer coming to this water source. So if you think about the preclinical shedding, shedding and all excreta, I mean, it's just every single one of those animals is exposed now. So th this, is, this is kind of highlights what we're facing as, as a management agency with this disease. And as such, we just have this inexorable spread. It is, it is pretty slow. It's not a fast moving um, spread of this disease, but it's inexorable. It, it has not been able to stop. And it's even jumped continents. So we found in South Korea, and that was linked back to moving um, captive elk, and then recently found it in Scandinavia. Still don't know how it got to Scandinavia. It was first detected in Norway. Um, and it seems to be a different strain uh, than, than what we have in North America. So that means transporting it out there is unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know how, how, it, how it got out there. It might have just been a natural occurrence or something else might be going on out there. But there is an increasing incidence and increasing geographic range. So this is over 15 years. That is, that's significant. Those dark gray counties are the counties where it was considered endemic by 2000. The light gray counties are the counties where it was found in free ranging deer or elk. And then the, the dots, the yellow and red dots are captive servant facilities that were positive. Um, the yellow dot, dots were, were um, uh, all the animals were culled and the red dots hadn't been culled by the time. And over 15 years, it's expanded, expanded greatly. And one of the, one of the questions, you know, we always have is, well, how the heck did it get to West Virginia or, or Michigan or um, uh, other places in the Midwest? Probably on four wheels. It was, it was probably moved by people. It was probably moved either by um, the captive servant industry, moving animals around or, or hunters moving, moving parts around. Uh, but, or even moving feed around. Uh, work out of Alberta has shown that some feed um, has uh, some contaminated feed may be a source of, of, of spread of this disease in the captive servant industry. For a long time, there was no evidence that there was any population level effects. This is a slow moving disease in an animal as well as geographically, but in an animal, in an animal it doesn't kill them quickly. So an animal, if it gets exposed later in life, it could still do its thing, make more animals. Might not affect the population, but some, some recent work in the late 2010s showed that no, indeed, once you get prevalence above a certain threshold, um, in, in Southeast Wyoming, it was about 10% uh, uh, annual de decline at 30% prevalence in white-tailed deer. 19% at 40% prevalence in mule deer. Um, it, you know, th this is gonna be a significant issue and it's something that's only gonna compound. 
and the economic impact has been significant both on hunters and and those who rely on on hunting for their businesses but also for the agencies uh, in 2002 when it was discovered in, in Wisconsin uh, this this work estimated that between 2002 and 2003 I lost about 53 to 79 million one year and 45 to 72 million another year just and, and that's continued in in Wisconsin and it will continue and it's also this double-edged sword right so some places you don't see a decline in in hunter tags where there's cwd some places you do um, but either way unless you have an increase in hunter tags that are are are, are giving an influx of, of money into the management um, agency you have this huge drain on the management agency too so it's kind of this double-edged sword losing money on one side need to spend more money to manage it on the other side, but it's not there. And then 2017, this, this came out, and this, this came out after another group showed that macaques were not susceptible. And, and macaques are significant because they're often used in translational human medicine work. So they're used as a stand-in for, for humans because you can't do experiments on humans. And, and uh, this group out of, out of Calgary and, and Germany showed that at least in their macaques, they were able to um, feed them way more CWD infected meat than a macaque could actually eat on its own. But they were, so, so that's not natural, but they were still able to, to induce CWD through, through oral, oral route of infection. And that was significant. And that, that ended up changing um, the CDC's and OFWA's recommendations to, to fall in line with the World Health Organization in that um, um, the recommendation to keep the agents of all known prion diseases from entering the human food chain. And that really uh, uh, was an impetus for states to, to go back and start increasing hunter outreach, testing, strengthening recommendations. And since then there's been more, more conversations about this at the federal level uh, in, in, in the legislature and, and there's more and more money slowly coming out to, to try to, to do more surveillance. So this is kind of where, where I start plugging in and where CDFW starts plugging in from um, uh, the California perspective. You know, we're, look at, we're li really looking at prevention through regulations and enforcement and education and outreach. And we've relied very heavily on that. We've got some really good regulations in place, many of which have been in place since the 90s. And um, now we're trying to focus on, on that education and outreach aspect. And the second side of that coin is that is a statewide management plan. We focused on surveillance and we've got a, been working from a draft surveillance plan for the last few years. And now we're trying to work towards that uh, a initial a response following initial detection and long-term management plans once it's detected. We've done some work with, with UC Davis to, to kind of, you know, maybe help us steer the bus a little bit in that uh, uh, modeling some of this import and spread risk. And, and this was done by one of our, our uh, veterinary residents, Andrew DeSalvo, who, who uh, sent some surveys out to um, some hunters and asked some questions focused on, on risky behaviors associated with um, high risk for importing uh, or moving CWD. And you know, asking how many hunters, you know, do you hunt out of state? If you hunt out of state, where do you hunt? That kind of stuff. A previous survey found that about 35% of, of Californians uh, with hunting license at that time would hunt out of state. And then this, this recent survey was much smaller, <laughs> uh, more of a pilot survey, but it found that that, that the two most hunted states are Colorado and Wyoming, other than California. And those are the two states that have the most CWD. And um, hunters often know that there are import regulations in place, but those regulations are often violated. And it was unclear whether that was because the regulations weren't understood or, um, or there wasn't inf effective enforcement or it was just a you know, hey, we're not going to worry about it. Um, we've never worried about it before, so we're not going to worry about it now. Uh, we didn't. We're, we're hoping to explore some of those uh, questions uh, with some some upcoming work with UC Davis to kind of take the next steps from this pilot project. Uh, but it definitely brought up some interesting uh, some interesting questions. 
And it also brought up this, this California meat processor question. Um, they do frequently process uh, animals from out of state. And, that's, and, and if they're processing animals from, from any of those, those orange states, um, they're potentially processing animals that could uh, be CWD positive. So it, it, we really uh, like to ask folks to get your animals tested in the state that you harvested it in it. And if you can wait, wait till you get your, your results back before you process it. Or better yet, process it in the state that you harvested it. Because this is how we think it's gonna come across. Uh, currently, this is our biggest risk factor. Is, is it moving across on four wheels um, uh, from, from a harvested animal in one of these positive states? Particularly Colorado and Wyoming, mainly because those are destination hunts. And um, having hunted in, in both of those states, they, they're great places to hunt. And they are the, the, the two highest prevalence of CWD currently. So some of the regulations, I'll let Captain Lawson hop in here. Okay, thanks, Brandon. Um, so a couple things. Uh, I first wanna thank everybody that's on this webinar to educate yourself about CWD. Uh, Brandon and I were a part of a task force to uh, monitor the CWD and how it's coming into the state. So understand that there's, even though you're getting a presentation from the two of us, there's a task force dedicated specifically, and we meet probably at least once a month to discuss pending issues and stuff like that. So uh, again, thank you for that because we need to get this uh, message out to all the hunters out there um, so that we could maybe slow down the spread of this disease to especially our state here in California. Um, this, this slide actually shows a few regulations that I'd like to cover for a few moments, but one of the more important things right now is the state of California that you see right there. Those are all the veins, if you will, of the road systems that are coming into California from other states. Um, one of the big arteries coming into the state, obviously, is uh, I-80, uh, same with I-5, um, the 15, the 40. Those are all major thoroughfares into the state of California, as well as the smaller ones. So as you can see, um, there's a lot of traffic activity that uh, comes from other states. You'll see in the bullet, point, uh, bullet sections here, the Fish and Game Code, there's some sections right there. Um, most of those refer to game farms. If you wanted to establish one, there's a process, some of the things you can and can't do. Um, the one I really want to focus on is at uh, 2353, which I think will apply to most of the audience here today. Um, let me just discuss, I'll read the actual section real quick and then I'll go into a little bit deeper. Uh, the, the code section says this, birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, and amphibians shall not be imported or possessed in the state unless all of the following requirements are met. One, the animal was legally taken and legally possessed outside of this state. Now, when and if you go hunting in another state, any of the laws that I, I talk about um, pertain to California. You also need to make sure that you are abiding by the rules and regulations of that state. So I encourage you that when you go on your hunts and stuff to please check with your local law enforcement officer there, your game warden, read up on the regulations just to make sure that there is not some regulation that may be illegal in that state, but, but legal here in California. So I'm just asking you to make sure that you check your regulations in the state that you hunt. Um, the second one is uh, a declaration is submitted to the department or a designated state or federal agency at or immediately before the time of entry in the form and manner prescribed by the department. I'd like to talk about that real quick. We call this a declaration form. And I don't know if we need to go off the screen of the PowerPoint, but I want to show the audience what a declaration um, form is. Sean, is this something that we want to have they, Brandon? They, they will have a link uh, in that will go to them after the webinar. We'll okay, great. Mm -hmm. Great. So let me just talk about this one that I'm holding in my hand right now um, is one that you can get from the department. Uh, most of your regional offices will have these. Um, license and Revenue Branch will have these. What's nice about this form is when you're coming across the state line into California, this is a triplicate form. So what's really nice about this is as you're coming into the ag station, you just can literally just rip out the section 
uh, that relates to the ag station and hand that to the inspector. Now he or she may or may not ask you to pull over to inspect your game, but having these filled out prior to entering into California will kind of speed the process up. Um, I myself have come back from hunting trips and it might be 11 o'clock at night and you're just kind of wanting to get home. You know, after a 10 day hunt, you're just tired, you just wanna get home. So having these with you uh, before you leave the state and having it filled out when you come in can speed up the process and really make it a little bit easier for you. Um, again, that's a triplicate form. There's four copies here. One copy you'll retain for yourself. Uh, one will go to the ag station and then there's two other forms that'll go to the department to two different um, spots within the department uh, for archives. Uh, the wardens will check on these to see what's coming in. Um, we have made cases based on these things. That's not our intent for these things. We just wanna know what's coming into the state. So uh, I hope that help answers that question, or I'm sorry, at least describes that code section that I think you really need to be aware of. I will wanna also mention to you um, the department, and I can speak for myself, I've been, running check stations for the last 10 years on I-80. Um, it's kind of a passion of mine. We generally run anywhere from three to four. We do su surprise inspections. Sometimes we do it on the weekends. Sometimes we do it on the weekdays. Um, so we're really monitoring what's coming across the state during those check stations because we want to make sure that um, people are educated. They're following the laws. They're removing the brain and spinal cord. And I'll talk about that here in a second. And it's surprising the number of animals that are still coming into the state and those hunters that are bringing in whole carcasses are kind of unaware of, of chronic waste and disease. And it's kind of sad. And that's gonna be like Dr. Monk has mentioned, that's how it's gonna get into our state. So, you know, we are there as a check station to make sure that people are not in over limits or with game that they don't have tags for, but also the main reason why we're there, well, actually two, one is quagga muscle and the second one is for chronic wasting disease. So um, we will be having probably three or four this year um, on I-80. So if you go out of state, uh, don't be surprised if you don't come through one of our check stations. Uh, I believe that was Sean that, that put that up. Uh, I'm hoping the declaration form, some you might be able to see it right now on the screen. It's a pretty self-explanatory form. It's pretty quick uh, to fill out. You know, obviously you're, you're declaring the type of animal you're bringing in. That's what the description is, how many, and what the estimated pounds are. Um, then it goes into the location of where the animal was taken. It asks for your hunting license, your, your vehicle license number, game tag number. Um, and then the, the rest of the information is on you. When you're coming into California, the date that you're coming across state line and what location you're entering. Is it I-80, is it I-5, the 40, the fit, the 15? That's where you'd place that stuff. Um, going on to, uh, if I can have that slide back, Brennan, I appreciate that. Oh, you got me. You got me working hard. Hold on. <laughs> well, oiled machine here. <laughs> Wrong slide again, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> Wrong choice. Yeah, well, everybody uh, will be receiving that, that importation link. So you can make copies of that before you go out of state. So you have them available. They're not going to be triplicate, but at least you can have three copies uh, for each, each of your party members. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on real quick, and, and Brandon, I apologize if it's something that you're going to talk about here in a minute, but being that I heard it, I, I just feel obligated to get it out. So we have had um, meat found in California that was brought over, let's say from Colorado where they did the testing and unbeknownst to the hunter, you know, cause there's a, a period of window from the time you get your meat tested, that could be a few days. Well, by then you're already back to California. And the next thing you know, um, you have meat that is part of a infected animal. So the one thing that we don't want you to do is to throw it away. Um, the best thing that we would ask you to do is contact our department and we'll make arrangements to maybe come and get that or not maybe we will come and get that because again, you throwing it in the garbage or the dump, um, that's how the infected meat gets out to the population here in, in California, at least our wildlife. So again, if you come across an infected animal or if the, 
if the state comes back and says, hey, you, you have an infected animal, please contact the department and we'll make arrangements to come in and get that meat from you. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll mention that later too, yeah. Okay. Um, the other one I wanna dive into, and uh, Brandon, if you can go to the next slide. I think I can. There we go. There we go. Um, is it, oh, well, well there we go. going back. 712, right? Th this is the, the, the chronic wasting disease code section that um, makes it illegal if you bring in one of these items and it's a violation. This is this would be the section that you'd be charged with. And, and again, we're not we don't want to charge you, um, but you know these are the rules that we have in place. And I'm going to go over them and and break them down a little bit in more simplistic terms so that you understand and know what you're doing when you come back across the state line. So I'll just actually read it. It is unlawful to import or possess any hunted I'm sorry hunter harvested deer, elk, carcass, or parts of any cervid carcass imported into the state except for the following body parts. Now I'm going to read them real quick uh, and then I'm, I got a couple of props over here that I can show to simplify it so it makes a little bit more sense to you. The first one is pretty simple you know portions of meat with no part of the spinal column brain or head attached. Um, you'll be surprised again how many times we run our check stations and we have whole carcasses coming across state line. I mean in some cases, uh, I can recall one time a horse trailer and they literally had cow elk stacked in there like cordwood. Um, and then the bottom ones weren't even um, gutted. They, they still had the innards inside. So never mind the fact that we had a want waste case because those ones at the bottom were rancid. Nonetheless, as far as this presentation is concerned, the worrisome part of it was that we had whole carcasses, meaning we still had brain, we still had spinal cord, all the things that you shouldn't be doing. Okay, so that's that's print A, right? Pretty simple. Um, print B is hides and capes, no spinal cord, column, brain tissue, or head, right? Maybe attached. Simple. The the next two that are highlighted, we're going to talk about it here in a second, but bear with me real quick. Is uh, C clean skull plates, no brain tissue may be present with antlers attached. D, antlers with no meat or tissue, tissue attached, except legally harvested or possessed ant, antlers. Man, I'm, I need to get a drink of water here. Antlers in velvet stage are allowed if no meat, brain, or other tissue is attached. E, here's the other one. Finished taxidermy mounts with no meat or tissue attached. Okay. Brandon, if you don't mind, can you switch off just for a second, just so I can show my props? Sure. Okay, so I want to talk about real quick, uh, probably the most common way animals come across the state line is uh, the skull plate, right? And what does that mean? And, and we got to make sure that we want a clean skull plate. So I have here, and I'm really hoping that I can show it to you properly, is a skull plate of actually a black tailed deer. This is one that, believe it or not, was shot here in California. I did not shoot it myself. Uh, but what I wanted to show and focus on is, is the skull plate here, all right? Now, when you turn it over, here's the part that we really want to focus on, this cavity right here. And this cavity is where the brain is usually located or found. So when you cut the animal, uh, uh, I'm sorry, when you cut off the skull plate off the head, we really want to focus on this area right here where the brain is. Um, and then if you go on the coat section, basically you got to remove all the meat off of it. Um, so that when we check it or inspect it, there's nothing on here. Um, so that's, that's the part you really want to look at. If it happens to have some of the ocular uh, or th where the eyeball is, there is a ocular stem that goes from the brain to the eyeball. Uh, it's a little bit trickier, but that's, you got to get that out, right? Because it's connected to the brain. So that can be troublesome. So if you actually come across the state line and it looks just like this, we applaud you. That's exactly what we're looking for. Um, one of the other code sections that I talked about was finished taxidermy work or um, uh, antlers with no meat or tissue attached. Now, these are becoming a very popular uh, way of mounting our any trophy that you may have. This is what they call a, a, a European mount. Now, again, I'm sorry, CWD doesn't, uh, we don't find it in antelope. 
So I'm just using this as a prop so that you understand. So I'm just waiting for somebody to bark that up and say you're, you're holding the wrong animal. But this is a European mount. Again, these, this is a very popular new, because like the one that's over my shoulder there, the taxidermy mounts are starting to become pretty expensive. Um, just like anything else, it goes up in price. So doing these yourself, and I think they look really nice on the wall. Um, a lot of people are, are apting to go to this. Now, with that said, this is where it gets really tricky because um, we have to get all the meat tissue off of this animal before it comes across the state line, right? Same with the brain, which is found inside the cavity right there. So you can imagine it's gonna take some effort to clean this skull up and that, so that it satisfies the re regulations that we have. Uh, the best way to do this would be to boil it in camp, right? Get all the meat tissue off. Um, pressure washers, believe it or not, after you boil it is a really effective way of getting all the meat off. So when you come across state line, we don't want to see, uh, and we see it a lot, um, you know, the hide still attached to the head and the, what we're getting from the hunters is, well, my taxidermist wants to cape it out. And that's usually true. The, the taxidermist likes to cape out things their way, but most of our California taxidermists know now that you know, we're really trying to stop the, the spread of chronic wasting disease. And so that we're really focusing and asking our hunters to clean up um, their animals before they bring them across state lines. So most of the time we don't hear that as much anymore. That's usually sometimes somebody got caught and they didn't want to get caught. And so that was the excuse they used, right? So again, just clean, make sure you get the, all the brains out of this thing and just clean it up to where you, you basically see what you're seeing right now, okay? Um, I believe that's all the, again, there was a, some other code sections there. So when you get time and you go back and you, and you look at this, this uh, PowerPoint presentation, take a look at those code sections that I didn't talk about. But again, those are re reference to game farms. And um, if anybody's interested in, or in the audience that is looking to do such, those are the regulations that you're going to need to look into to uh, see what you can and can't do. Great. Brandon? Perfect. Thank you, Captain Lawson. That was that was fantastic. Uh, I love the props. Um, where were you last time I gave this? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, best handling practices. Um, Captain Lawson went through went through what's in our regs and our and, and the code and and there are certain things that that you know go above and beyond that are considered best management practice, but are not. That are not included in our in our regulations, um, and and you know obviously some of this is 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 standard, right? Wear 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 gloves when field dressing, wash your hands, um, and instruments after field dressing. And if you're hunting in states that you know that you have CWD, um, some of the things I've I've heard hunters do is is they have a knife that all they do with that knife is that's what they use to to deal with. Um, uh, the 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 scarier parts like the like the brainstem like if they're just articulating the head from the spinal cord they only use that knife and they set it aside and that's one thing that they don't have to clean as much because cleaning to disinfect for prions is 10 percent bleach for 30 minutes soaking for 30 minutes you can imagine it's not good for your knife um, disposable knives are, are nice um, as long as you got you got a disposable dispose of them in a sharps container um, and they should be treated like bio, uh, biomedical waste. Uh, but some states have this in their, um, uh, in some of their CWD positive areas where in their rules, their special rules for these areas, they, some, some states may require you to bone out all meat, leave brain, spinal cord, eyes, spleen, lymph nodes, and internal organs all where it's hot harvested. We, we don't require that. We don't require that for importing them. It's certainly a best management or a best practice um, if you if you practice the precautionary principle. That's certainly what I would recommend, um, and and be aware of of the various state regulations. And within states, they may they will have different regulations based on whether they have a CWD management zone, um, and those will include not only what can you do with what tissues you have, but what you. Wh where you can take animals once you've 
remove them from the field. So some states won't let you even move the animal outside of the management zone until it tests negative. So know, know the rules where you're hunting, okay? That's, that's the moral of that story. Um, and, you know, this, we've worked with, with some communications folks. For, for me, that was the first time doing that. And this has been fun because um, they put together some really cool stuff. And I've gotten to, to talk to a lot more people about CWD and why, why I think it's important. And so we've certainly invested in communication and this, this all goes back to our outreach and education campaign. And you guys will probably start seeing some emails if you haven't already. We've got some pamphlets going out. We've got some pamphlets um, in some of our biologists' hands. Uh, we're trying to get some outreach to the meat processors. Um, so we're, we're trying, to, trying to hit this hard and, and I think uh, Robert Karen was on today and, and, and others in his, in his group for, for helping guide us as neophytes in communication. And we're, we're multimodal. So we've got a lot of this stuff in the Big Game Hunting Digest, um, but we're also um, really trying to get people to hit on our CWD webpage. So you notice this wildlife.ca.gov um, backslash CWD has been popping up on a lot of these slides. Uh, we're really trying to get that to be our landing page. Is it perfect? No, it's not. <laughs> it's a lot better than it was uh, last year. It, and, and, it, and it certainly can be better. And we tried to, to update it as frequently as possible. But that is, that is where we've got a lot of information on one, what is CWD? We've got an FAQ there. Um, we also have information on our, on our surveillance. And this, we really focused on this initially and still are focused on this because we haven't got to where, we, where I think we need to be. And detecting CWD early is, is really our I say best chance. It's really our only chance to effectively respond to and manage this disease. And, and so this is where we, where we are. And, and we started surveillance back in 2000. And, and that, was, that was based on a lot of federal money that was coming out of USDA APHIS um, as, as news of CWD spreading and, and this, that, and the other. And on the wake of, of the mad cow, uh, variant crutchfield Jakob out, disease outbreak in, in people and, and cattle. And um, we were getting, you know, $250,000, $350,000 a year. And, and, and our best effort was 2004, we were able to get about 665 samples and 95% of these are coming from hunters. These are hunter, hunter harvested deer and elk um, from California. Uh, 2010, 2011, notice it drops off significantly. And, and that, that was just opportunistic sampling. And that's because our, our federal funds dried up. And then um, we were, we're trying to restart an active surveillance plant program without federal funds. Um, we do have a modest amount coming in now, um, but uh, for all intents and purposes, this is, this is basically our, you know, on our management budgets. And so I'm actually tickled pink that we were able to get 450 samples last year with all the fires and COVID and, and this, that, and the other. However, our goal is up there in red. We're trying to get to 1500 samples or samples from 1500 deer and elk or elk per year each year. And we're trying to make that sustainable. And, and to make that sustainable, I think we really need to kind of institutionalize this in, in what CDFW does and, and, and what hunters think about, hey, I shot a deer. Hey, I need to get that tested for CWD if I can. How do I do that? So uh, we're, we, we can't do this without hunters. There's, there is no way we can do this without hunters. And so I've, I've talked to a couple hunting groups now and, and I really enjoy the conversations, the questions we get, and invariably the comments are, how can we help? How can we help? The best way to help right now is, is if you can to visit these um, CWD check stations and they're voluntary CWD sampling check stations. And it's just a place where we've got um, um, some biologists set up and um, some collection kits, and hopefully you can drive through real easy, back of the truck, take some samples. The sampling process, you have to cut down through the neck to get down to lymph nodes. So if you're planning on a, on a, on a shoulder mount, um, it will ruin the cape. So be aware of that. If you, if you want your cape, you need to cape it out before you get to it or you need to not get it tested. 
Um, but the, the focus is on hunter harvested deer and we're focusing on deer, not elk because in the West, the disease epidemiology, ecology of the disease is really driven by mule deer and not by elk. Um, and, and we don't have it in, in black-tailed deer yet, so we don't know how that'll work. Um, Black-tailed deer act a little bit more like white-tailed deer um, than, than, than mule deer do, so it might look a little bit more like it does out east. But out west, it's mule deer driving the, driving the bus with, with CWD, so we're really focused on getting samples from, from harvested, hunter-harvested mule deer. And, and we want to work with hunters directly as much as we can at those sampling stations. And this, this um, map is on our website as a drop down menu for surveillance and this map. And then we're also trying to work with meat processors and we're trying to incentivize meat processors to help to have them help us collect samples. So if you have a meat processor that you work with um, regularly, you know, ask them if they're, if they're participating in that program and if they haven't heard about it, um, send them to this website um, or, or I'll have an email at the end that they, that they can email if they're interested in joining the program. And, and we also have a, a spreadsheet with the same details that are on that map. Um, and on that map, you can kind of click on, click on the orange button and it'll tell you where it is and the date. Um, uh, the dates are not, you know, it's usually high volume weekends, um, what we think are gonna be high volume weekends, obviously weather dependent, obviously fire dependent. Last year we had to cancel a lot of these and that was a bummer. Um, so, so check this website frequently, check this spreadsheet frequently, and if you are able to, please swing by these, these uh, sampling stations. This is probably the best way to, to get your animal um, sampled and tested. And a lot of questions are, how long does it take to, to get a, a test result back? States that are doing thousands of these are usually between four to six weeks. Um, I think Colorado says three to four weeks, but they're, they're, they're unique because they, they get to do it all themselves. Um, we're a little bit further out, and part of that is because um, our state is so big, and part of that is because um, our samples are kind of trickling in. So to make it uh, affordable for us, we have to send batches of, of you know, 40 plus to the, to the diagnostic lab. Um, otherwise, it would be it would be about twice as expensive to do the testing one at a time. So we try to get results back quickly, um, but it it can be extended. Hey, hey Brennan. Yep. Uh, just real quick, just for the audience, I just want to make sure that you, you're not talking about the samples of deer coming in from out of state. You're talking about getting the samples from within California only. Correct. This okay. is these are surveillance um, stations. These are for California deer. We really want to encourage y'all to get your deer or elk tested in the state that you harvested it for a couple of reasons. One, it's gonna be the quickest turnaround because then you don't, have to, you don't have to drive it in, get it to us. Two, if you are following the regulations, the tissues that we need to test are no longer on that animal. So you should not be bringing in lymph nodes. So I'll go back to this. This gentleman right here is cutting down through the neck to um, sample the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. If you've got no um, spinal cord, you're not gonna have those retropharyngeal lymph nodes unless you made a very uh, unique cut that somehow included them. But again, you're not supposed to have any meat or tissues on your head, so they shouldn't be there. So we should not be testing deer from out of state. You need to get those tested in the state you harvested. And, and the other reason why that's important is because that state wants that information too. And there's a big push to, to increase um, communication between states for, for CWD in particular, but also for other diseases and other management concerns. But right now there are some major roadblocks up that, that precludes us from being able to share a lot of that information. And, and so it's, it's very difficult for me to get any information from Colorado or Wyoming on, hunt, on Californians that are hunting in Colorado particular because of their state laws that, that, that protect that information. Good state laws for many reasons, but you know, it, it, it can be difficult when we're trying to figure out how to, how to manage 
you know, moving bits and pieces across the country. So there, there's a federal task force that's looking at, at how to how to make that better. And, and hopefully in the next few years, we'll have some tools for that, but currently we don't. So the states that you're hunting in, they want that information um, and, and they will be happy to, to, to help you get it tested. And, and the reason we have focused on testing, and, and, and I, have a, I have a friend that works in Arkansas now, so <laughs> hopefully she will forgive me. Um, but this, this is a great example. So the, the, all, all the, the work done on surveillance says, yeah, you need to test about 300 deer per sampling unit. Um, that'll give you strong confidence to be able to detect CWD at a 1% prevalence, which is a pretty low prevalence. But if you have 5 million deer in your state, 1% of 5 million is a big number. And what Arkansas found was, you know, these things are clustered. So they were focusing on testing elk. And the reason they were testing elk, um, all they were basically testing all hunter harvested elk and 300 deer a year. And they were testing all hunter harvested elk because the, the, the elk population in Arkansas was a transplant population from Colorado. So they felt like th those were high risk animals. And they are, um, um, but they were kind of not, not focusing as much on the deer. And, and, and so they got their first positive from elk harvested in October of 2015, and they got and 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 the test results came back in 2016. So just to give you an idea, that's that was at least two months, um, and maybe more. I think it was more like three or four months before they got the test results back. Um, what happened there was okay. We are going to um, increase our surveillance. We're going to go do some special hunt, get some sharpshooters out, kill a bunch of deer in the area that they have that they found the uh, the positive elk. They ended up finding six elk in two counties that were positive, but 260 white-tailed deer in seven counties. And based on, on, on the number of animals that they took, that was a 23% prevalence in white-tailed deer. And that was after their initial detection. So that, that tells me that was a pretty late detection. Hopefully we can avoid that in California. Um, and, th and that's kind of why we, we wanted to focus on surveillance. And then, and then everything follows surveillance, right? We can't do anything really, we can do things to prevent CWD, but we can't do anything to manage CWD until we detect it, right? So we've got to, we've got to be, have active surveillance to make sure that we're, we're trying to look for it so we can catch it when it comes in. And then once that happens, it'll kick into a, an initial response. And that's really gonna be, where do we have it? And how much do we have of it? So this, this kind of map on the side, a red dot would be, you know, an example of where you might find your what, you know, your first positive might be that red dot, and you might put a, a surveillance zone or, or a couple donut rings around it, saying, okay, this is our heavy surveillance zone, this is our light surveillance zone. For us, we're going to probably base that on, on, you know, the home range of the deer for that area, and then you're going to test intensively within that that inner circle, maybe less intensively outside, and then maybe less intensively further outside. And the idea is each time you get a positive, those circles change. And you're just trying to figure out how much you have in that area and whereabouts it is. And it would probably increase our, our surveillance in adjacent hunt zones. So we're kind of covering those things. So that's what the initial response is going to look like. It's probably going to focus on, 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 on what we can do based on what authority we have. And then, and then that's going to dictate what our, what our long-term management options likely are. Um, the goal would be to reduce disease prevalence and decrease, decrease transmission. Ideally, we'd like to eradicate it, but based on, on current knowledge and current tools available, we don't think that that's feasible. Um, Norway tried and, and they went, they hit it really hard. They, they, they took out an entire reindeer herd where they, where they got their initial positive. Uh, 2,000 animals, and uh, two years after that, they found a positive in an adjacent herd. Um, so I think it really goes back to that long incubation period, that 15 plus months. You know, the first time you detect it, it's likely been there for a little while. Um, and and the long-term management goals are going to focus on on harvest management. If we can target target disease spots with that, we will. 
reducing artificial points of host concentration. So we've got some good um, regs on the book about no feeding. That's a big one, particularly out east where, where people like to feed their deer. Um, and, and, and it must be sustainable. And, and that's been really the nail in, in, in management coffin uh, in the West that has CWD and, and in the East. Nobody likes to see a bunch of dead animals and, 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 and the political will and the, and, the, and the stakeholder will to maintain some of that, that high harvest rates or, or in some places they might, they might have sharpshooters. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not sustainable. So, so having stakeholder buy-in, having, having um, management buy-in and, and, and our commission buy-in are all important things. So what can you do? Um, follow regulations. As we, we talked a lot about what regulations we have in our state, um, but also you need to be cognizant of all the state, the regulations in all the states that you are hunting in and traveling through. And that's something that doesn't always get across. Um, at an anecdotal uh, story from Idaho where um, some Californians hunted in Montana um, had a house, rented a house in Idaho because it was cheaper and, or because they, they, they needed a place to, to set up shop because they knew that they couldn't import certain things into California. So they knew California's regs, um, but they set up a, they, they got a, a house in, in Idaho and they're washing their, their harvest from Montana, which has CWD and Idaho doesn't. And they failed to understand that, that Idaho too has regulations that preclude them from being able to do that. Um, so that, that, that really drove the, the message home for me is we have to be aware of all the states in between too, because each state has their own regulations and, and some of those may or be, be more or less strict than ours. Educate your friends, peers. I mean, this, this is part of it. This is one of the things I enjoy. I enjoy talking about this. I enjoy answering good questions. I enjoy answering bad questions. Um, get your harvest tested. Get your harvest tested in the state you harvested it, if at all possible. Um, three to four weeks, like I said, and that's Colorado typically, they're, they're saying three to four weeks. Um, for us, it's gonna be a bit longer. For some states, it might be a bit longer. The Arkansas example, a couple, couple three, four months. Um, we were trying to keep ours down to less than two months. Um, but some of the, as, as we get later in the hunting season, um, uh, uh, that, that can be difficult for us. Uh, the more surveillance we do, the better turnaround times we should have. And participate in those voluntary surveillance uh, check stations if you can. Um, talk to your uh, uh, meat processor, see if they're participating. You can even see if they're willing to take the lymph nodes for you. Um, and, and either give them to you to get to us, or, or if they're participating in our program, they can get them to us. Um, call your local CDFW officer um, or the Wildlife Health Lab if you see a deer or elk um, with symptoms. Um, this link here, uh, the wildlife.ca.gov CWD, houses most of that information. Also links for additional information and contact information. This is an example of it. You get how to get your deer tested, find your, CW, your CWD testing results and some frequently asked questions, all things that we have on our website. Also some additional links, report a sick deer over here. I can't scroll down, but if you did scroll down, um, uh, you'd see additional links, links to like CWD um, Alliance website, which has a lot of good information. I think Sean has included that in the link package. Uh, and this this map is the is the most up to date map for um, not this one, but if you click on it, it'll take you to the USGS website, which has the most up to date map. So lots of good resources. We're really trying to make this user friendly. Um, it's improved significantly over the last couple of years. It's not perfect, but uh, we hope you guys can find what you what you need um, there. And if not, we hope you can ask lots of questions now. Well, let's do the last two polls really quick so we can see uh, just confirmation whether they're paying attention or not. And uh, we'll see what our last couple of jokes are too. So here's the question. What statement about CWD is true? It's a single choice. Uh, it kills deer, elk, and other game species very rapidly. 
is incurable disease that can cause deer and elk. Uh, shoot, I have to open this. Population declines and costs hunters agencies a bunch of money. Uh, vaccinating animals against CWD prion has <clears throat> uh, shown to be effective. People moving deer and elk or their parts is not believed to facilitate the spread of CWD. And CWD has been detected in California. Which one is true? And then the joke is uh, an infectious disease walks into a bar. The bartender says, we don't serve infectious diseases in this bar. The disease replies, you're not a very good host. <laughs> Nobody's laughing. Nobody's I'll, I'll say that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's participating either. All right. Um, we put him to sleep. I did, I guess. Maybe because I had it there forever. Does anybody answer? Anybody try? All right. Uh, it says the poll is closed. Well, on my side, it says it's open. All right. Well, that didn't work. I'll end the poll. Share results. Stop sharing. All right. Nobody got that? Okay, I'll try one more. Let's see. Launch it. I'm launching it. Here it goes. You should see it. Hopefully you do. Uh, what can hunters do to prevent the spread of CWD? Select all that apply. Establish a game farm and import deer and elk or for private hunts so we're not impacting our free-ranging herd. Get your deer or elk tested for CWD through a state wildlife agency where you have it harvested. If you are, your deer or elk test positive for CWD, discard any parts from the CWD positive animals in the woods or for scavengers to eat. Uh, bone out meat. Okay, you guys are all getting it right. No one follow California and other states regulation. And the last joke was, what happens when a doctor catches a disease he already found a cure for? He gets a taste of his own medicine. All right. So I'll give it a couple that was, more seconds. That was a dad joke right there. <laughs> All right, I'll end the poll and share my results. And I would say in, in general that, yeah, you guys got them all right. So it's uh, number two, get your deer or elk tested for CWD through the state agency where you harvested it. Bone out meat, leave spine, brain, spinal cord, eyes, spleen, all internal organs where it was harvested and no one follow California and other states regulations. Um, yeah, basically we wanna stop the spread. That's what we're here for, that's what we're here to do. Um, the two gentlemen tonight, I wanna to thank you guys for coming on and helping share this information. We had a couple of people who really enjoyed the fact that you uh, shared this, they wouldn't have found it otherwise, uh, other places. So um, thank you for coming on to our webinar. Uh, share it with a friend, it will be, re it is recorded. Uh, hopefully it'll be posted by tomorrow evening. Uh, otherwise, just look for it on our YouTube um, platform. And if you have a chance to share it with somebody, please do. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. And uh, I think we did a good job of explaining everything. A couple there's, of thank yous. There's one, one question I saw in the chat. Um, question about the timing for uh, uh, testing, why it takes so long. Um, there's there are rapid tests now, but to get the the tissue into a form that has that that can be used for the rapid test, there's like five steps. Um, and if you think about the the tissue has to come from the hunter, has to go to the agency, be logged in, and then it has to be sent to the diagnostic lab, and then it has to be processed, and then for it to cost less than like for us, it's it costs like you know, just under 30 bucks a test, but for it to cost that little, you've got to run 90 at a time. So if you send one in at a time, it costs about three times as much. So that's one of the, for us, that's that's a large reason why it takes time. That's because we're trying to get to that 90. And if you imagine like, we're only doing 450 samples a year, it might take a while to get to 90. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, if there's some that we didn't answer tonight, you can go ahead and email me. I'm going to be sending an EVA a links page out to you, uh, which will include the other states' links and their CWD protocols. So please look at that. If you're going out of state, you're going through a state on your way back to California, 
uh, make sure you follow the laws. We don't want you to have any negative experiences regarding your hunting trip. We want it all to be fun, safe, and conserving our wildlife for the right reason, okay? So until next time, uh, hopefully next week, or not next week, I'm looking at September 9th, I believe it is, is gonna be a, a cow tip program. So you're gonna hear some stories about the success of our cow tip and how it's important to California wildlife. And until then, I'll see you later. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, panelists. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.